Okay. Um, so we are ready to go. So everyone, thanks for being patient. And I'd like to uh, introduce Mike Bloom, who is um, labor and employment attorney for uh, Foster Swift, Collins and Smith. And I think for most of you, he is a familiar figure. Take it away, Mike. All right, so um, then let's just uh, get right into it. Um, you know, this morning the, uh, is the long awaited discussion of uh, Michigan's wage and hour uh, and sick leave laws. We've been watching this and waiting for this for quite some time. So I'm pleased that you're here this morning to uh, go through where we're at. Uh, at the moment, and I say at the moment because we now have a Supreme Court decision. Uh, we have a lot of guidance, but unfortunately, we still have some unanswered questions. And we have uh, a request by three agencies, uh, the Attorney General's Office, uh, the Treasury Department, and uh, Labor and Economic uh, Opportunity, uh, Wage and Hour Division, have requested clarification from the Supreme Court as to how to implement um, the wage laws. So we remain unsure exactly uh, where the minimum wage is going to be until we get that clarification. It was requested uh, that the Supreme Court issue the clarification by the 15th, which was yesterday. I have not seen it. Uh, so that is still a variable. Uh, Wage and Hour uh, has uh, posted uh, quite a bit of information and a very good FAQ that I think is in the chat box and also on the last slide of my presentation. So you'll see it there. Uh, but that is a work in process by Wage and Hour's uh, admission. They are still reviewing and analyzing some issues. So uh, we are a long ways further along knowing wh what we're going to be dealing with uh, in 2015, but we're not 100% there. So I just wanted to say that. Um, but uh, we, as we work through this, I want to step back just briefly so that um, we can all be on the same page and understand uh, where we came from, uh, a little bit of the process, and where we're going. And I think it's important uh, to do that so that we can get a full understanding of what's going to take effect in 2025. And what will uh, take effect February 21st of 2025 is the Earned Sick Time Act, ESTA, which is a language that uh, we have been using uh, throughout this discussion, but it's important that everybody understands the differences between the Earned Sick Time Act, which will be the law February 21st, 2025, and the Paid Medical Leave Act, which is Michigan's current law. So uh, the uh, PMLA is the current law, it is being enforced, it will be enforced until replaced, uh, and we're going to go through uh, the differences. And a number, uh, increased number of employers are covered by the ESTA um, that are not covered by the PMLA, but to the extent that the PMLA uh, does cover uh, the library, uh, it is currently in place. So uh, hopefully everybody that is covered by the PMLA is um, uh, complying with it currently. Uh, the same date, the February 21st, 2025 uh, date applies also to, um, it, it applies to sick leave and the wage. So they take effect on the exact same date. So how did we get here? Uh, it's been a long journey. It all started with a couple of ballot initiatives back in uh, November of 2018. Seems like forever ago now. It was six uh, years ago. Uh, but that's how this got started. And Michigan is somewhat unique uh, with ballot initiatives because in Michigan, it is a way that a law can be implemented 
even if it is not passed by the legislature or signed by the governor. So the people in Michigan can basically write their own laws using a ballot initiative. And that's how this got started. Uh, so you know, basically, uh, this is a way that uh, the people in the state of Michigan can get a law passed if they do not believe that their elected representatives are being responsive to what they want to do. And that's how this uh, got started. So why didn't the ballot initiative take effect uh, in 2018 or uh, shortly thereafter? The reason for that is that the legislature at that time used what is known as the adopt and amend strategy. And the adopt and amend strategy uh, allowed or so the legislature at least thought, and the Supreme Court disagreed that they could do it constitutionally the way they did it. But what they did is they said, okay, this is a ballot initiative. We will adopt the uh, initiative. Now, normally when that happens, that means it doesn't go to uh, the people for a vote. It doesn't go on the ballot. It becomes the law because it was adopted by the legislature and therefore it becomes law. So that's what happened in September of 2018, before the election, the Michigan legislature adopted both the ESTA and the uh, wage law as it was written in the ballot initiative. But then shortly thereafter, in the same legislative session, uh, they amended both of the laws. And the amendment brought us the Paid Medical Leave Act and the Amended Wage Act, which took effect March of 29th of 2019. So that is what took effect rather than the ballot initiative. And so currently, uh, as I already said, with respect to the uh, sick leave, but it's also true with the uh, wage laws, is that both laws as adopted and then amended by the legislature in 2019 are the current laws that all libraries must be complying with. So with respect to the sick uh, leave, what this adopt and amend uh, strategy did is it renamed uh, the uh, sick leave to Paid Medical Leave Act, it changed the employer's threshold requirement for being covered. Uh, under the PMLA, it's 50 or more employees. Uh, it allows for employers to front load the leave uh, to avoid any carryover into the following year. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail and it removed the right to bring a private uh, civil lawsuit for violations. So those were the big changes that the legislature uh, did that the ballot initiative would have put into place that the way this was done uh, did not take effect. With respect to the wage laws, uh, what the adopt and amend strategy did was it stretched out the increases for the minimum wage uh, the both laws said it's, you know, we're going to get to $12 an hour as minimum wage. Uh, but the ballot initiative would have done that by 2022. So obviously, uh, you know, we would already be there if the ballot initiative had been uh, implemented. Uh, instead, what the legislature did in 2019 is they said $12 is fine, but we're going to stretch it out and it's not going to take effect until 2030. So uh, stretched out the um, increase in minimum wage by another eight years. And it also removed a provision for uh, basically what we uh, refer to as COLA, cost of living increases. Um, under the uh, ballot initiative, the minimum wage would be increased 
uh, yearly based on inflation. That was removed. Uh, it is now uh, causing some considerable issues. And that's one of the reasons for the request for clarification to the Supreme Court. So we'll talk about that a little more detail when we get to that. Uh, and it also removed a provision for eliminating the TIP credit. And for those that were at the uh, director's meeting on Friday, we talked briefly about that. To the extent that there is some uh, consensus on maybe revising uh, this law between now and the end of the year or before it takes effect, March uh, or um, February 21st. Um, it's a tip credit that I think uh, is getting looked at very, very closely. So that's what happened in 2018 and 2019. And of course, uh, in our world, what follows is legal challenges. And the legal challenges uh, took quite a bit of time to work through. It went through the uh, <clears throat> initial uh, trial court. It went through the uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, two different uh, decisions there. The uh, uh, initial court said it was unconstitutional uh, what the legislature did. The Court of Appeals said, ah, no, nope, we don't agree. We think that what they did is perfectly fine under the Constitution. So it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court overruled the Court of Appeals in a 4-3 decision. So uh, yeah, pretty contentious uh, rulings all the way through, and a lot of issues and disagreements even among the courts on whether this was constitutional. But it's important to understand that this was never what should minimum wage be. Should uh, sick leave be provided? If so, how much? That was never part of any of the appeal. It was simply a constitutional issue of can the Michigan legislature adopt a ballot initiative and then amend it in the uh, same legislative session. Very, very, very narrow um, issue that the courts were looking at. But that's what caused us the six-year delay in getting to it. And at this point, the uh, decision is final. I don't think it's uh, going to be changed, that you cannot do what the legislature did in uh, 2018. Uh, but what they can do is it can change the law uh, in a following legislative session, which is, again, will this... Uh, happen? It might. It still could, uh, particularly with the tip credit, but maybe a little broader than that. We'll see uh, what the legislature does. Uh, but this law is still before um, February 21st of 2025 could uh, still be amended by the legislature. We will see uh, if that actually happens. So let's look at, now the Supreme Court says that you have to reinstate the intent of the ballot initiative. It's obviously impossible to reinstate exactly what the ballot initiative did because it said you go to um, $12 an hour two years ago and obviously can't do that. So what do you do? Uh, what the Supreme Court said is, well, there's a gradual minimum wage increase that uh, has to be phased in. It was supposed to be phased in starting in 2019. We are now in 2024. This will be effective in 2025. So what we're going to do is phase it in starting uh, in February 21st of 2025. That's when the phase in period is going to begin. Um, and uh, keep in mind that uh, Michigan's current minimum wage is 10.33 per hour. That's been adjusted, uh, you know, for a few reasons: the uh, um, inflation uh, and uh, the economy, and the um, number of people that were on layoff uh, or unemployed and whatnot. That took into effect. So it's hard to track exactly how we got to 10.33 an hour. But uh, if you go to the Wage and Hour website, um, it'll show you how that was calculated. And that's the current uh, minimum wage that will immediately go uh, up 
February 21st of 2025. The question becomes to what? And the to what is going to be $12 per hour, but you can't stop there because the Supreme Court says there has to be an inflation adjustment that we're still waiting to see how to calculate that. And there's a number of different possibilities that were presented to the Supreme Court by the uh, Treasury Department um, and the Attorney General on how potentially this could play out. And the numbers could be significantly different, but the general... Um, thought, or at least a discussion that I've seen, is that when this does take effect, February 21st of 2025, the minimum wage will be somewhere between $12.25 an hour and $12.48 an hour. So for those that are budgeting, looking forward, trying to figure out exactly, you know, where are we uh, if this is going to affect, uh, you know, your particular library, I think you should err on the side of the higher number, the twelve forty-eight an hour, and assume for um, your proactive uh, compliance that that will be what the minimum wage law will be as of uh, that time. And then, when you go forward with this gradual uh, progression of increases. Uh, February 21st of 26, so they're annual. In 26, uh, it'll go to um, whatever the uh, um, amount. And that minimum wage there uh, is the uh, what it would be currently. That's going to have to go from the $12 up to whatever it is effective. February 21st of 25 plus the inflation adjustment. So you it all is going to depend on what the Treasury Department does in February, uh, or effective February 21st of 25, with the minimum wage, and then everything is going to uh, escalate from there. Each year, um, there's automatic increases, um, you know, for the first uh, few years, and then it's going to be a uh, COLA adjustment. So there's a lot of moving parts here, a lot of calculations. The uh, Department of Treasury is working through this. Uh, all I included here was um, what uh, the uh, bill would have done um, if it had taken effect and what we need to do now looking forward. And again, you don't need to calculate this. The Treasury Department will do that. Uh, we can watch the Wage and Hour uh, website. They will give us the specific numbers but we do not currently have them. But just uh, to repeat myself, I think for the moment, what you should do is that effective February 21st, 2025, assume that the minimum wage will be somewhere between $12.25 an hour and $12.48 an hour. Okay, so let's now switch to the difference between the ESTA and the uh, PMLA. Uh, the biggest thing, obviously, especially for libraries, is how many libraries will be covered. Uh, currently, uh, there's a lot of libraries that are not covered by the uh, current sick leave law. And the reason for that is the PMLA only covers employers with 50 or more employees. What the legislature did is they sort of tracked when they amended uh, or adopted and then amended the law uh, in 2018. They kind of patterned it after the FMLA. And so uh, like the FMLA, a lot of libraries are not covered by the FMLA because they don't have enough eligible employees. Um, the PMLA is uh, sort of the same. Uh, that will go away. The uh, ESDA will cover every library. And uh, when I say every library, assuming you have one employee, but if you don't have one employee, you probably don't have a library. So it'll cover every library. Um, the definition of the employee is also uh, very 
interesting and significant issue uh, between the ESTA and the PMLA. Under the PMLA, there were numerous exceptions, including the independent contractors, employees covered by labor contract, employees who worked 25 or fewer hours in the preceding year. They were all, but they, so you're uh, part-time employees, basically. Um, the ESTA has changed that significantly. And it is very, very broad. It says an individual engaged in service to an employer uh, in the business of the employer, except that the employee does not include an individual employed by the United States government. So when I first read that, and uh, I was not alone, I thought, how broad is this really going to uh, be defined when this uh, takes effect? Because it literally could uh, have covered everybody that does anything in connection with the library. Well, the Wage and Hour has helped us here. Uh, they have a uh, FAQ that tightens that up a little bit, and I think we can rely on it because, uh, you know, it's the uh, Wage and Hour has the authority to um, <clears throat> uh, implement it and determine how it will be implemented. And they have the FAQ, you have a uh, link to it, uh, and it does a couple of things. It says that an eligible employee is an individual, and it uses the engaged in service to an employer and the business of the employer, but it adds to it, and from whom the employer is required to withhold federal income tax per, uh, for income tax purposes. So that is not in the ballot initiative. It's not in the law, but it is in the FAQ from Wage and Hour. So I think this, and there's probably going to be some questions. We can go through that in more detail um, if anybody has questions. But I think this answers the question of are uh, independent contractors covered? The answer is if they're properly classified, uh, no. But then we get into are they properly classified as independent contractors? Because if they are, then you don't have to issue a W-2. Uh, it also answers questions of um, do you have to uh, pay uh, sick leave or provide sick leave to uh, volunteers or to people that have a uh, um, stipend just to sit on a commission or a uh, committee or a, a board. And again, my position is that no, because the wage and hour is determined that as long as there's no obligation to um, withhold income tax purposes and issue a W-2, they are not uh, eligible for sick pay. So I think that's a significant clarification we've received from Wage and Hour. And this is, I think they, they posted this about uh, two weeks ago. So uh, that was at least, uh, I think, a welcome uh, clarification that's helpful. Now the accrual is different. Um, the uh, currently those covered by the PMLA is one hour for every 35 hours. Uh, the uh, new law, February 21st of next year, will be uh, 30 hours, uh, one hour for every 30 hours. And instead of capping out at 40 hours of accrual time, it uh, caps out at 72 hours. Um, but there is a difference in the size of the library here because it's 72 hours of accrual uh, for everybody, but for those uh, that are considered small employers, uh, under 10 employees, uh, only 40 of those hours are paid and the remainder are uh, unpaid. So if you're between one and nine employees, uh, the 40 uh, hour uh, paid uh, leave is your cap. Once you hit 10, it becomes uh, 72 hours. So briefly, just going through the employer coverage, uh, and we're going to, um, you know, that's in a summary. But the uh, takeaway on the employer coverage is that uh, the uh, considerably more libraries will be covered by the ESTA than the PMLA. And with respect to the eligible employees, um, and, you know, I just went through that on how the uh, wage and hour uh, FAQs uh, clarified this, but you're still going to have uh, employees 
who currently are not eligible for um, sick leave will be eligible uh, for sick leave under the law effective February 21st of 25. And then again, the accrual rate, um, the uh, sick leave accrual will be faster under the ESTA than under the PMLA. And I already mentioned the cap, but the uh, accrual cap uh, currently is 40 hours. That'll expand if you have uh, 10 employees uh, to 72 paid. Uh, if you're under 10 to uh, 40 paid and the remainder unpaid. So the bottom line is that beginning February 21st of 2025, all employees will be provided with sick leave and most employees or many employees will be able to use greater amounts of sick leave than I think uh, many of the libraries currently are providing. So that's something you need to take a look at. Um, I would start earlier rather than later and look at you know, what you're providing now. Will you be in compliance with uh, the ESTA February 21st of 2025? And for budgeting purposes, I would track how uh, the usage of the current sick leave uh, or the uh, unpaid and whatnot, and then you can get an idea of how from an economic standpoint, this is gonna affect the library uh, when it takes effect. And carryover is an interesting issue, and I've received a lot of questions on how this will uh, play out. And there is some discussions uh, in the FAQ from the uh, Wage and Hour Division. Um, and the confusion here comes in not so much on what the carryover provisions are, but how they're going to take effect depending on how the library uh, provides the leave. And I'll explain that in a minute, but uh, let's look at the PMLA. Uh, it says that employers can use, uh, can carry over uh, 40 hours, but if the uh, employer front loads, there's no carryover. Under the ESTA, there's no cap and any sick leave has to be carried over, allowed to be carried over from year to year. So under the PMLA, you could avoid carryover entirely by front loading. Um, and even if you didn't, you could cap it at 40 hours. So you could uh, control you know, how many hours there will be year to year in a sick leave bank. That will no longer uh, be available uh, under the ESTA. But here is the um, question that is going to come up, I think. And that is if you have a sick leave bank, it's uh, fairly easy to calculate how much sick leave is in the bank. Look at how much was accrued. Uh, let's use the large employer, 10 or more employees, and they have 72 hours. Uh, they haven't used any. So now they can carry over 72 hours because that's uh, the uh, cap on what they earned. Let's assume that they uh, earned only what the law requires. Um, then you carry over the 72. The next year, you get the 72 plus an additional 72. Uh, so the question is, can they now take uh, 144 hours of sick leave the following year? And the answer is no. You can cap the usage. You just can't cap what is carried over and what is in the bank. So you're going to have to track that. But it gets more complicated if you don't have a segregated sick leave bank. Because the law allows you to have a PTL instead of a segregated vacation, personal sick leave, which a lot, if not most, employers are going to, if not already there. So if you have a PTO policy, and the question is, is, does that comply with the ESTA? The answer is yes. 
uh, you can have a um, PTL policy. And as long as it provides uh, accrual uh, or provides sick leave in an amount sufficient to satisfy the ESTA, uh, the fact that it's in PTO instead of a sick bank, the uh, wage and hour isn't uh, going to say that's not compliant. So you can uh, have a PTO that will be deemed to be in compliance as long as uh, you can use the PTO time for anything you could use the sick leave time for. But the complicating factor comes in that if you have vacation rolled into the PTO bank as well as sick leave, you may have more than the 72 hours, uh, some of which was intended to be for a vacation. And so the questions are going to become if they have, by way of example, 80 hours in the PTO bank. Can you only roll over 72 hours, 72 hours, because that's what the ESTA says is the maximum accrual of sick leave, or do you have to roll over the whole 80? And I think the answer to that, if you have one bank for any time off that includes sick time, you're going to have to carry over the entire amount. So if you want to limit the amount that you are going to carry over, I think you're probably going to have to segregate the sick leave into a, um, a separate bank, limit how much sick leave can be uh, carried over in compliance with the ESTA, and then you can limit your carryover of vacation to whatever you want. Uh, that, uh, that's going to be totally within your discretion. So the, the thing to think about at the moment uh, and um, figure out how you want to structure this is do you want one bank to allow uh, it all leave sufficient to comply with the ESTA uh, or do you want to have a separate sick bank and that will give you a little more control but a little more administrative burden so I think that's a, uh, something you need to think about and figure out uh, where you want to go with it And similar uh, to the issue of the carryover is front loading. Uh, under the PMLA, front loading eliminated the carryover requirement. Um, the question can, uh, has come up, and there's been a lot of um, discussion on this. Does the STA allow front loading at all? And there, I have read a lot of uh, articles and discussions uh, that were posted to various uh, websites, um, lawyers or law firms' websites and whatnot, um, or uh, just through the uh, internet. And a lot of attorneys have taken the position, at least initially, that the ESDI does not uh, provide for front loading, so it's probably not permitted. I think that the Wage and Hour Division disagrees with that. Um, the there's uh, language in the Act, Section 5, that says that if the uh, front loading is sufficient to provide the same amount, the same purposes, and the same conditions as is required under the ESTA, then even though it's front loaded at the beginning of the year, you're still going to be in compliance. You do not have to take the administrative uh, responsibility to uh, accrue it and only provide it in one hour every uh, 30 hours work. You can put it all in at the beginning. But again, you have to make sure that um, you can use that for the uh, same conditions uh, as provided under the Act. And the um, one area that I think you have to uh, keep in mind is if you front load X number of hours, let's say you front load 80 hours, uh, you're certainly in compliance with the amount. The question is, is uh, what about um, using it? And if you have a PTO bank that says that, you know, this is intended for vacation, vacation has to be requested in advance and has to be taken in 
uh, blocks of, you know, full day or a uh, full week, or, you know, we want uh, time away for vacation, uh, that usage restriction is not going to comply with ESTA. So you're not going to be able to uh, do that because under the uh, ESTA, Uh, you have you can only uh, require uh, seven days advance notice when it's foreseeable, uh, and the uh, employees are going to be able to use it in the smallest um, increment allowed or kept by the uh, payroll system. Uh, so that could be as um, low as six minutes. Some uh, employers uh, use six minute increments. Some use uh, quarter hour increments. But if you have a PTO bank that says you must uh, use it in full day increments, that is not going to be a condition that's consistent with the uh, ESTA. Uh, so um, that might uh, affect whether you can front load it. So that's another area I haven't seen any specific authority on that, but I suspect that if you put limitations uh, on a PTO bank, that are not in the ESTA or permitted under the ESTA, you might have a problem. So now let's talk about uh, the reasons for the sick leave, because it's got to be uh, uh, whatever you have in the PTO bank or any bank has to be allowed uh, for specific uses required under the ESTA. And there's some changes even under the um, current law uh, the current law did add that you have to uh, include uh, family uh, members, uh, physical, psychological, or legal effects of domestic uh, violence or sexual assault. So that is currently under Michigan's law. That is going to be kept under the ESTA. They've also added uh, meetings at employees' child school related to the child's health or disability or the effect of domestic violence. So there is an added uh, element to the ESTA that does not currently uh, exist under the PMLA, and certainly uh, that would not affect libraries that aren't covered by the PMLA. So uh, when you have a sick leave uh, <clears throat> in a bank that can be used, uh, you need to make sure that you understand that sick leave isn't just sick leave. Uh, even though it's called sick time, uh, it's beyond the uh, employee or the family member's uh, illnesses, uh, but it also gets expanded to uh, the psychological effects of domestic violence, sexual assault, or uh, school events. So you need to uh, make sure you're aware that employees that ask for time off for those purposes uh, will now be legally required. And the uh, covered family members, there are some uh, differences, uh, but not significant. I don't think it's largely the same definition of the family member, uh, except the uh, ESTA uh, specifically covers domestic partners and any other individual related by blood or affinity. I don't think in reality that changes the way most of these uh, policies have been interpreted, but that is now statutory. So you need to make sure that you're uh, following that. And this is the issue I uh, hit on uh, in a little different uh, context, but this is the combined PTO policy. Um, and the uh, ESTA will allow a combined PTO policy, as we discussed. Uh, but if you do that, you have to take into consideration some of the um, maybe un unintended consequences, maybe just consequences. But you got to, uh, if you have the combined, you might lose a little uh, control on uh, what you can restrict on carryover. And uh, you might have to use allow use of PTO for reasons uh, beyond what you previously had allowed the use for. Now, the documentation, um, <clears throat> this area was will be changed. Under the PMLA, there were no restrictions on employers requiring 
uh, documentation following paid sick leave. Um, what the PMLA said is whatever your uh, normal policies are, you can enforce. And if you have policies for medical documentation, you can continue to uh, require it. Um, that is being changed uh, under the ESTA. Under the ESTA, employers must wait for an employee to be absent for more than three consecutive days before requiring an employee to provide any documentation. So this is causing a lot of um, discussion and a lot of uh, uh, concerns, I think, because if somebody takes a day here, a day there, calls in sick, um, you know, calls in uh, on a Monday morning and then the following Monday morning, and you're starting to get a little bit suspicious, uh, the ESTA says uh, if it's not three days, you cannot ask for documentation. So there's going to be um, some concerns and some questions as how, you know, what you can do to guard against uh, abuse of taking um, sick time, a day here, a day there. Uh, and how can you be uh, assured that it's uh, legitimate? Uh, I don't know at this point that the ESTA provides a lot of um, tools to the employer to guard against abuse, but that's something we're going to have to uh, keep our eyes on and pay attention to. So how can we avoid uh, sick leave from being uh, abused? Um, the other change, though, and I think this is significant as well, is that if the employer uh, requires uh, <clears throat> documentation, the employer has to pay for it. So uh, when that was first um, when that was first proposed or first uh, included in the bill, the question is, is how broad is that going to be um, when the employer has to pay? And the terminology is all costs associated with getting the required documentation. Uh, the question is, does that include uh, gas, somebody leaves their house, they fill up the gas tank to go to the doctor to get the doctor's note the required. And the question is, uh, can the employee say, you got to pay for my gas to go there? Do you have to pay for this? Do you have to pay for that? The answer, I think, is no. I think Wage and Hour has helped us there. Uh, I think their position is that, no, it's going to be whatever it costs the employee to actually get the documentation. Some doctors will charge a copay or charge a, a certain amount uh, to get uh, the documentation. You see this also in the FMLA, but whatever that cost of going to the doctor and getting the required documentation is going to be the employer's responsibility, but it's not going to be uh, all of the ancillary uh, costs associated with um, uh, getting to the doctor's office. And Record keeping, I think, is uh, going to be something that Wage and Hour is going to be looking at, and maybe even more so uh, employees' attorneys, uh, what we call plaintiffs' attorneys, because of now uh, the penalties have been reinstated. So you have to make sure that your uh, record keeping requirements are compliant. Uh, under the ESTA, uh, the employer must retain uh, records documenting the hours worked and the earned sick time taken by the employee for three years. So uh, every library is going to have to have documentation going back three years on the hours worked, even if you have a salaried employee that the presumption is 40 hours uh, for accrual purposes. You still have to keep track of um, how many hours uh, were um, uh, worked to make sure that there uh, is sufficient uh, accrual and the sick time taken by the employee. So if you don't do that, you're going to have a, you're not going to be able to show compliance with the law. Um, and the, then you know again with the uh, hourly employee. You should be doing that anyways. It's with the salaried employee, salaried exempt employee, that you're going to have to pay attention and say, okay, we're going to have to keep track of, um, you know, how many uh, 
days off were taken, particularly for uh, sick leave purposes. And the reason why you're going to have to do that is to show that you're complying with the law. Oops. And on the penalties, um, the ESTA had some significant uh, penalties that did not previously exist. Uh, and if, if there's uh, any adverse employment action taken against an employee within 90 days after the person um, uh, has taken any protected uh, activity under the statute, uh, there is a presumption that you violated the law. You know, I've always uh, been uh, taught that you're presumed innocent until proven otherwise under the ESTA, uh, the presumption is kind of flipped. If an employee files a complaint, if they inform anybody about uh, the um, library's the violations or claimed violations, if they engage in uh, any investigation, if they oppose, pretty broad, the uh, second to the last bullet point, oppose any policy or practice under the act, uh, what we've seen in other statutes is the opposition clause, or uh, informs any other uh, employee of their rights under this law. So they're uh, working with another employee. They don't have any problems, but another employee does, so they help them out. That's all protected activity under the ESTA. And if that occurred within 90 days uh, prior to an adverse uh, action, there's a presumption that you violated the law. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty unique presumption in my mind. Uh, it's not that it can't be rebutted, but it switches or flips the burden of proof onto the employer uh, as to why you were in compliance with the ESTA. And with the increased uh, penalties comes a longer time to file. Under the PMLA, uh, there was six months after the alleged violation. Oops. Under the ESTA, an employee can file a civil action, not just file with um, the government, but file a civil action against an employer anytime within three years after the violation uh, was uh, known. So it's the same three-year statute of limitations now where uh, in Michigan discrimination laws under Elliott Larson are. So it gives you the same right to the court system within three years after uh, the um, violation became known or the claim violation became known or you had information to believe that there was a violation. So much longer uh, statute of limitations. So the takeaways are that... Um, you know, I think all libraries have to review their existing policies and procedures, uh, not only to make sure that you're in compliance with the current law, because you should always be doing that. Uh, if you're not, you should probably uh, take some proactive uh, steps there, but then compare where you're at with what will take effect uh, February 21st of 2025. Um, and I think that uh, as we get closer to that date, Training is going to be critical in showing compliance. Uh, one of the things I'm sure is going to come up is that uh, what did you do to ensure that uh, the uh, library director and the um, uh, department heads uh, were aware of the law and uh, properly implemented it? So training, I think, is going to be critical. Uh, and the last bullet point is um, probably more uh, your um, legal counsel, um, because you should be working with your uh, attorneys to make sure that uh, what you do February 21st, 2025 is compliant with the then interpreted uh, laws. Uh, you know, I will continue to monitor this, obviously, and I'll continue to post on our website uh, any changes. Uh, I'm sure other uh, attorneys are doing the same as is wage an hour. Uh, so, uh, but the proactive approach to this, I think, is going to be important to show that when you implement your policies, 
They are in compliance. You've had good faith attempt to fully comply. And I think that's going to go a long way with the wage and hour division if they get a, um, a claim that you violated the law. So I know there's a number of questions that came up. And I, Mike, I, I've been making a list. Yeah, and I see there's a bunch in the chat do you, do you box. Want me and to... I wanted to um, leave uh, ample time okay. to go through those so we can get to those okay. uh, specific I have, uh, I have a list. Yeah, I've been or making. We can, or any other questions. I've been cutting and pasting the ones out of the chat into a list. Um, so is it okay if I ask you those? Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, if we currently have vacation time and sick time combined as just PTO, do we need to separate it? No, you do not need to separate it. What that does, though, is it raises the issues of um, can you put restrictions on the conditions for which the PTO is used? Uh, I think there's going to be issues there, and there's also going to be implications on rollover. Because under the ESTA, if you separate it, uh, you're only obligated to roll over what was accrued as sick leave. If it's uh, combined, uh, I think you're going to have to roll over everything. Now, there's a couple of questions about front loading. Um, so is it okay to front load sick time? Yes. And that's a question that's been... Um, raised by many, um, discussed by probably even more. Um, there was a question early on as to whether front loading would be permitted because it was specifically permitted under the PMLA. Uh, the ESTA is silent on it. Uh, so the thought was, well, if the um, legislature specifically included it in the ESTA or in the PMLA, but they did not include it in the ESDA. They must have intended it not to be allowed. Um, I think the um, problem with that uh, thought process is that this wasn't something the legislature did. This was a uh, um, ballot initiative. And so I think you, I don't think you can read in legislative intent into that. And section five specifically says you will be deemed in compliance if it's a, a sufficient uh, amount and uh, the same conditions. So I think front loading is definitely allowed. Yeah, the, the Leo uh, webinar that they did, that's the same thing that they said. They said right, that the exactly. feeling was. Um, does ESTA leave need to be paid out at termination? No, um, with one caveat. <laughs> There's a caveat to everything. <laughs> Um, there is a, a specific provision that says if there is a termination of employment for any reason, whether it's a voluntary quit, whether it's an involuntary discharge, whether it's a retirement, uh, whatever, if there's a separation from employment, there uh, is no obligation to pay out ESTA. Uh, but the caveat is if somebody leaves they have time, sick time in a bank, mm -hmm. and then they come back within six months. When they come back, they're going to have to have back into their sick bank what was in there when they left. What if you combine PTO, uh, your vacation and your sick time together? So if you have vacation time in there, which is typically a, a you know deferred compensation, do you have to pay out vacation versus sick or no? Well, again, under the uh, ESTA, you do not have to pay out any time. Okay. Um, so I think to the extent that it involves sick time, the answer is no. What's going to complicate that if you combine them is that PTO is um, a fringe benefit. Uh, ESTA now or sick leave is statutory. Uh, but the um, vacation or PTO is a fringe benefit. And the uh, Wages and Fringe Benefits Act says that the, um, it's going to be enforced as the policy is written. Okay. So I think that if you have a policy that says we will pay out 
uh, we won't pay out sick time, but we will pay out uh, unused vacation. You're going to have a problem with the Wages and Freedom Benefits Act if you don't pay that out. So you got to take a look at, you got to decide first what you want to do and then make sure that your policy is tight because the um, wage and hour is going to uh, look at that right. if they get a claim. They're going to look at it under the EFTA, but that's, I think, the easy piece. They're also going to look at it under the uh, Wages and Fringe Benefits Act to make sure that you're complying with your own policy. So it sounds like if you combine, you're really better off talking to your attorney and making sure your policies uh, and procedures are all in line. <laughs> yeah, I would say two things. Talk to the board, make sure the board uh, um, gives clear guidance on what they want to do and then work with your attorney to make sure that the policy um, accomplishes what the board wants to implement. So we have quite a few questions on um, varying types of part-time employees. So if you have a standard part-time employer who works like 18 hours or less per week, are they included in this? Yes. Okay. If you have uh, an employee who is uh, like a college student employee paid under the federal um, work study act, do they have to be included under this? I'm, I'm not sure about that because I'm not entirely sure how that program is structured, but I think the answer to that is you have to look at the wage and hours FAQ, mm -hmm. and if under that program, the library has an obligation to withhold taxes and issue a W-2, then yes, they would be included. Okay. If not, then no, I don't think they would. So okay. I think you have to look at the obligations to withhold uh, taxes. Okay. And we have several people who are asking about, so there's a, a in, I'm sure you know about this, in libraries, there's there's a, an employee kind of level that are subs, right? So you have sure. a few people on a list that you call every once in a while when you have a staff member on vacation or, um, and you you bring them in for a limit, usually a limited amount of hours per, per year. Um, what about them? They're going to be entitled to sick leave. How much and will they ever get enough and actually use it? I don't know. But uh, yeah, they they have to get um, credit for one uh, hour of sick time for every 30 hours worked. Uh, so once they hit their 30th hour work, they have to be given one hour of sick time. Mm -hmm. And that cannot be um, taken away right. unless they leave employment. So, so it doesn't it doesn't matter if the sub say if the if the employer can't figure out how the sub would take it. Um, if they let's say the sub uh, is uh, gets pregnant and is on maternity leave. So they say, OK, I can't sub for the next six months. They would be able to take any sick leave accrued during that period. Correct. I think that's correct. To the um, extent that they have, they the have it, right, right. And they're probably not going to have a lot, but yeah, they right. might be able to take a day or two under those circumstances. Um, okay, so this is an unusual question, um, and the person who uh, stated it might need to get on. So does unpaid leave, we know unpaid leave applies to part-time people, could the non-working portion of their week be construed as being available as unpaid leave? Now, I'm not exactly sure what they're asking here. Um, who who inputted that question? Do you want to get on and explain what, what you're asking? Hi, that Hi, was Susan. Ms. Claire. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, could they actually take that time and get paid if it's paid leave? No. If it's unpaid leave, can they just, is it considered the rest of the week that they're not working? Is that considered unpaid leave anyway? Because they're not working. I'm... If I'm understanding the question correctly, they are only scheduled to work so many hours during the week. Right, like two days. So they, yeah, so they're scheduled to work two days. They're not 
uh, and they're not on the schedule, not working for the remainder remaining three days. Right. Um, so under those circumstances, those two days, uh, however many hours they work in those two days, once that hits 30, they'd get one day of sick leave. They would not accrue anything for the three days they're not scheduled and they don't work. Um, so that goes to the accrual is, you know, could they use the um, one of the days where they weren't scheduled to work, weren't going to work anyways, and get paid through the um, sick leave bank, I think is really where your question might be. And That's the one answer of them. to that is no, because that would not be one of the reasons why um, ESTA uh, time can be used. Uh, okay. The fact that it's not scheduled and they wouldn't work anyways uh, would not be any of the purposes for which the ESTA can be used. If they worked such that they accrued unpaid leave and some of their time is spent not working, is that unpaid leave in itself? Like they work Monday and Tuesday and they have a couple of hours of unpaid leave do do they have to... okay i get it they would be able to take two hours that they accrued off of the days that they would work but they're not going to get paid and that it just we wouldn't take any of the days off into consideration it's the days they work i think i get yeah I and my own on question. the unpaid let me just address the uh um, unpaid issue, and I'm not sure if you're talking about the small employer, the nine employees yes. or fewer. Um, you, that is, it really doesn't change what we've just discussed. What the uh, the way the ESTA works is the uh, the employee will earn um, one hour of sick time. For every 30 hours worked. I think what you're talking there, so uh, they would have, uh, if there's a large employer, 10 or more, all of that time would be paid. For the small employer, you might earn 72 hours, but because you're a small employer, only 40 of it is paid, but you right. would still have to work to get any accrual. So in your situation, the days three, four, and five wouldn't count regardless. But when they're actually taking them, I think is where my question lies. And they, they would have to obviously take it when they were scheduled to work. They, they either get they paid yes. or they get unpaid, but they get the time off. Correct. They would have to miss time. They would otherwise work because of one of the reasons permitted under the ESTA. Thank you. Okay. Um, our library has a just ratified union contract that will be in effect for nearly three more years. Please discuss how the ESTA reforms may be affected by having a current ratified contract. Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, and I haven't specifically looked at that uh, for ESTA purposes. But the general rule is if there's a contract in place, uh, um, new law cannot um, negate or impede the requirements of the contract. You have to wait. We've seen this in a number of different areas. So I think that the um, you cannot have the ESDA uh, undercut an existing contract. I think that the ESTA would take effect uh, after um, the contract uh, was terminated. or and, and you can't extend a contract to get around the law. There's been case law on that as well. Um, that's just my um, uh, you know, big picture thoughts on that. So don't hold me to that. If you want to, uh, something more specific, uh, ask your uh, attorney specifically, or you know, I'd be uh, happy to look at that. Uh, I don't have a specific authority for you right now, but I don't think that the ESDA as of February 21st, 2025 is going to be constitutionally permitted to change requirements of an existing contract. 
our clerk, so this is another sub question, um, only fill in when others need time off. Can we just pay them for the sick time as opposed to them using it? No, because the law says that they have, uh, you know, for instance, uh, if they can't, first of all, uh, the purpose of the law is that they can't work. So I don't know if you, you know, if they can work, I don't know if they would meet the requirements for taking the leave anyway, so you probably wouldn't even have to pay it. Um, but if they do need it, if they're too sick to work, you don't want them in the library anyways. And, you know, then uh, if they have to be at school for one of those reasons, or if there's been a domestic uh, assault, and, you know, emotionally, they can't come into work. You don't want to put yourself in a position where you're going to say, no, we're going to pay you, but you have to work. Um, that would not be permitted. Um, if we do not front load, can we provide a one time only beginning balance, for example, 16 hours in year one? That way, our existing employees won't start the first benefit year with no sick time. I'm not really following that question. They're, so they're, front, they're providing 16 hours for what purposes? So the question is, is that if if you have, and there's, there's that, what I think is a similar question. So if you have staff um, that um, can, can, so that you don't have staff that start the year with no leave, can you provide them with additional leave to start with in, and then they accrue from there? Oh, so if I'm understanding this question, they wouldn't have accrued anything under the ESTA. Right. Uh, and this may take, uh, may uh, be even more relevant if they want to provide uh, leave for new hires because under the ESTA, uh, you don't have to allow them to use it for uh, the first uh, three months um, or, you know, or, they, or at least for the first uh, month. So the question I think is, if you don't front load, uh, you're going to accrue. Uh, can you nevertheless um, provide uh, leave time above and beyond what is required under the ESTA as a fringe benefit? The answer to that is yes, you certainly can do that. I think the pro the more difficult question is going to be if you do that and then the employee works 30 hours and they would get another day, can you say, we're not giving you an additional day because we've already given you uh, 16 hours? Uh, I think that might be a little problematic. So you have to decide if you're going to front load uh, for ESTA purposes or if you're going to uh, provide supplemental leave uh, in addition to ESDA. And if you're going to do that, I think you can provide whatever you want at the beginning of the year, but you're still going to have to comply with the accrual requirement. Um, if you have staff who already have leave, already have banked leave under the current benefits policy, um, and they have more than 72 hours banked, are they allowed to use all that is banked if needed? If, it it's starting in February. So if in February when this starts, you have staff that already have banked leave, um, can they keep that leave and use it when after the program starts? As a fringe benefit, yes. Um, and that's something that's going to be a little bit um, uh, touchy in how exactly how this is rolled out. Because February... Um, 21st of 2025 is going to come and go. The question is for employees that have pre-ESTA banks and then you have to come into compliance, the question is going to be, are you going to freeze that bank? And then, uh, and I I think we're at, what I think would be the easiest way to administer this is freeze the old bank and then determine uh, open up the new bank on day one and then decide how much you want to put into the bank in leave time. Could it be all of what was in the old bank? Sure. Do you have to? Not necessarily. But if you do it that way, you can say we're going to freeze it. And now going forward, we're going to provide this amount of time. We're going to front load for ESDA 80 hours, just by way of example. And there's 120 in the old bank. 
what are you going to do with the uh, difference? And the uh, question is going to depend on how the policy is written, because if it's uh, use it or lose it, uh, it could be forfeited. Um, um, but if you don't have a forfeiture uh, language in it, uh, you might have to pay it out under the Wages and Fringe Benefits Act. So you need to look at those and figure out how you want to move from uh, the bank that's in effect the day before ESDA takes effect and how you're going to um, start it up. Um, so if if we use a fiscal or calendar year that starts, um, this starts February 21st. So it's a portion of a year. Do we prorate paid and unpaid leave for the for the portion of the of the first fiscal or calendar year the laws are in effect? So if you're already in a a, a fiscal year and then the law changes mid fiscal year, how do you manage well, it? Well, and we're talking about prorating sick leave. Yes. Well, uh, that's going to um I think be an issue only if it's front loaded, because okay. if it's not front loaded, then you're going to have to start accruing, um, you know, when the law takes effect, uh, and that that's not going to be dependent on uh, your fiscal year. That's right. going to be uh, based on from February 21st forward. Uh, every 30 hours is one hour, so it wouldn't apply in that situation. If it's front loaded, I think it could be. Um, prorated based on how many hours would be accrued during the applicable um, year, and then you can prorate it to comply with that. And if your staff already have uh, banked leave, then you would just deal with it as you described in the prior question? I think so, yes. Okay. Um, Let's see. Once an employee has used up their 72 hours of sick time, what is the recommended policy for how to deal with additional time off? Oh, that's a pretty broad question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, this is always an um, issue on employees, you know, and it's and I don't think this is ESTA uh, specific. Uh, this is when you have a certain amount of uh, paid time off, um, old school sick leave, um, you know, whatever. And then people exhaust the amount that's allowed. Uh, the question may be, does the employer have to allow unpaid leave? And the general answer to that is no. No, if you provide as a library uh, a certain amount of available paid time off and that's exhausted and the employee still can't meet the requirements um, by coming into work, that can be treated as an attendance problem, excessive absenteeism. There's a big caveat to that, though, and that is that if the reason for the inability to work after exhausting the available paid time off is medical. Um, then, uh, it, you know, and there's two laws that could creep in here. One is the FMLA, if the library is uh, covered by the FMLA. Um, so you might have FMLA time. That would be unpaid, but it would be additional time off. Um, but even if the FMLA doesn't apply, if you have somebody that has a medical uh, condition that is sufficiently severe to rise to the disability, because every medical uh, issue is not a disability. But if it is a disability, under the ADA, it specifically says as a reasonable accommodation, you may have to provide additional unpaid leave beyond what is otherwise provided by the library's policies as a reasonable accommodation. So that could, so it depends on the reason why they can't work. But if it's not FMLA or ADA covered, and it's simply that they want or need more time off than the library allows, does the library have to allow it as unpaid? The answer is no. What is the estimated minimum wage for minors in February, 2025? 
<laughs> when I, I could calculate that because it's a percentage, but I don't know what the minimum wage is going to be that day. It depends on whether the Supreme Court provides uh, clarification. And then if not, the uh, wage and hour or the Treasury Department, I guess, has already said how they're going to do it. And I think it's going to be the uh, 1248 number. Um, but we have to get that number. And then if it's a, uh, a lesser rate because of the uh, minors uh, training wage or whatnot, it's all it's all off of that rate. Uh, so we're going to need that rate before uh, we can determine that. Um, and I believe that's stated in the law, right? What the percentage is for yes. youth. Um, so you recommended uh, twelve forty that you use twelve forty eight an hour uh, as a as a estimated benchmark for your budget for the minimum wage in February. Budgeting, yes, for budgeting purposes only, and the reason for that is, and I don't know if uh, recommended, I would do that if I was in charge of the budget, only so that you don't uh, budget uh, too low. And the only reason uh, why I use that is the estimates I've seen coming out of the Treasury Department uh, and the request for clarification of the Supreme Court. Uh, there's, I think, five different possibilities on how to calculate. And I think that's the range from low to high, depending on what the Supreme Court says about it. So that's, I think, the highest uh, that it's going to be. So just for um, budgeting purposes, erring on the side of caution and not under budgeting, uh, that's why I recommended that number. Here's, okay, if you front load ESTA and they use it all and leave employment before actually accruing the time, can an employer deduct in the final paycheck? No, for two reasons. Number one, if you front load, that's front loaded. Yeah, um, it means they don't have to accrue it, right? If you front load it, you're giving right. it to them. And the other yeah. thing is you're going to have problems with the um, Payment of Wages and Fringe Benefits Act, it, right in there, it specifically says you cannot deduct out of the final pay uh, any amounts owed uh, unless there is a uh, authorization signed by the employee at the time, uh, and it's got to be a voluntary. So the uh, employee could voluntarily agree to pay it back, but you would need a written authorization at the time saying that, uh, you know, um, we, uh, you know, I use this, I wasn't um entitled to it i will voluntarily pay it back uh but if you front load the front load is just that it's uh it's uh in their uh in their bank currently we have a 90-day waiting period before staff can start using their pto with these changes it sounds like they can accrue and start using pto from day one right yes with the exception of new employees New employees, uh, you can have a requirement that they have to wait for uh, 90 days. Can the library offer more than one hour per 30 hours worked? Yes. Uh, we give one hour for every 29 worked. Um, so that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can always provide more. You just can't uh, provide less. And the um, issue, while we're talking about that, uh, the where I see a potential uh, complication is in the front loading for um, part-time employees because the section five of the uh, statute says that uh, you yes, you will be deemed to be in compliance as long as what you front load is sufficient to cover what will be uh, otherwise uh, accrued under the STA. So you have a part-time employee that you've had them for 20 years and they've always worked uh, exactly half time. So you say, all right, normally it would be um, 72 hours. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut that in half and that's what we're going to front load. The, and that will be fine unless something happens and they work more than anticipated. So at that point, what you're going to have to do is once they work any hours beyond uh, the calculation for what the amount that was front loaded, you're going to have to supplement that bank. And if you don't supplement once the extra hours were worked, then you're not going to be in compliance. So you can front load and be deemed to be in compliance, but you still have to monitor it. 
when we are when we are talking about 10 employees, are we talking about 10 full time equivalents or 10 part time employees, like 10 individual employees, no matter what they work or full time equivalent? The 10 employees. Um, well, it's it's not quite that easy. Unfortunately, <laughs> nothing ever is when you have uh, laws take effect, but it's um, it is 10 or more employees in 20 or more work weeks in the current or previous calendar year. And so that's a formula that we uh, see in other statutes, but it's 20 or more work weeks in the uh, current or prior calendar year. And so, and it's just bodies. It's not um, FDs, it's not full-time, it's not part-time, it's bodies. And if you have on payroll uh, 10 employees in 20 or more work weeks, either the prior year or the current year, then you will be a covered employer uh, and as a, um, a large employer. And that, if you trigger that this year and then you drop next year down to eight employees, you're still covered as a large employer because next year you'll go back a year and you'll have uh, 10 um, names on the payroll uh, for 20 or more weeks. So you're stuck with that for two years once you trigger it. Uh, how much flexibility do we have with computing accrual of sick leave, of paid sick leave? Do we need to track each individual and give them exactly one hour for every 30 hours worked? Or can we accrue those hour in general categories? For instance, our part-time employees who work 20 hours a week currently accrue four hours of paid sick time a month. Could we just say that everyone who works fewer than 20 hours a week will accrue two hours of paid sick time a month? Um, it's going to depend on the math. If it's not, uh, if if you do the math and it falls short of the one hour for every 30 hours work, that would not be in compliance. It'd be a violation. If, and said differently, if it's above that, then it's, um, for lack of a better way of saying it, no harm, no foul because of Section 5. It says if you provide a uh, sufficient amount to uh, comply, you'll be deemed to be in compliance. But if you fall short, uh, then that would be a violation potentially triggering the penalties. Okay. Uh, is it, it is one hour accrued for each 30 hours, not one day accrued? One hour. Right. Um, does the unpaid leave only accrue once they reach the cap or does it accrue simultaneously? Like you accrue paid leave first and then unpaid? Oh, um, you accrue. Uh, I think the real, I think that's a difference between accrue and usage. You accrue for every 30 hours work. Um, and then for the small employer, um, 40 is paid and uh, the remainder is unpaid. I think, Claire, the question is, can you... For, require that they take the unpaid first before the paid? And the answer is no. They have to be allowed to use the uh, paid portion of it first. Can there be a different sick time accrual schedule for full-time employees versus part-time employees, or does it need to be uniform? As long as it complies with the ESTA, you can have different amounts. So but as long as it's at least it, it, one yeah. hour per 30 hours. Yeah, as long as part-time doesn't go below the uh, requirement. But yeah, you, uh, there's uh, again, you have there's a floor, and then above that, you can provide what you want. It's really as a uh, fringe benefit. So you can have different fringe benefits for different categories of employees. So and kind of building on that, our full-time people get a sick bank of 12 days a fiscal year. Is this a problem? Do we need to switch them to earning sick time by hours worked? Again, they do not uh, need to accrue by hours as long as what they're getting is compliant. Um, so there's can... no requirement, said differently, there is no requirement that uh, there's a strict adherence to the accounting of uh, 30 hours, you get one hour. 
uh, it's not they, it's not going to be enforced that way, but they are going to enforce it by saying, what would you have accrued had you looked at it that way, and what did you provide? Mm -hmm. And as long as you provided enough, you're okay. One last question. Um, can you please confirm the rollover rule? It caps it 72 hours accruable each year, and all 72 can roll over each year forever? Yes, this is the difference between rollover and... Uh, actually, there's three prongs to this. There's rollover, there's usage, and there's forfeiture. Um, rollover is simple. Whatever you have in the bank, it's rolled over entirely. Um, then the next year, you're going to, and let's assume they don't use any for two or three years. Now you're going to have a lot of hours in that uh, bank. Um, the amount that the... Uh, employee is allowed to use can be capped. For a large employer of 72, um, the small employer of 40 plus, uh, you know, the remainder is unpaid. Um, so you can cap what's in the bank, how much can be used in any given year, but you can't cap what you're going to allow to be um, rolled over. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, and the concern might be, well, they're going to have a huge bank and, you know, at some point, this is going to be an unfunded liability. Uh, and the answer to that is no, it's not. Um, you can budget based on what you're going to allow to be used any given year. You have control over that by capping it on the usage side. And then if they leave, you don't have to pay it out. So it's not an unfunded liability. But there is no way to camp. Uh, the, you know, what is potentially going to be in the bank. Okay. And that concludes our questions. So I want to thank you, Mike, very much for joining us. This was enormously helpful. Um, it provided a lot of clarification. But thank you very much. We very much appreciate it. And I'm sure that you are going to be extremely busy even more busy <laughs> over the next several months. Yeah, well, um, yeah, and I really appreciate the opportunity. I think this is important. I think it's very important that all libraries throughout Michigan, um, you know, understand what their uh, options and requirements are because there's potential liability. So I'm very uh, pleased to be able to assist in that process. But like I said, this is still a work in process. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, everybody is still analyzing this, evaluating this, including the Supreme Court. Um, so I'm going to continue to monitor it. I will continue to assist uh, whenever and wherever. And, you know, I'll uh, participate in as many of these monthly uh, library uh, uh, directors meetings as possible. And uh, yeah, I'm sure we're going to cool. talk more about this. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And I hope you have a good rest of your Monday. And thanks a lot, Mike.